Ha ha, it's Wednesday, it's eight o'clock and we're here again. It's George Orr on Raw Raw on our occasional series. We are maturing into occasional George Orr talkers. Um, I hope you're really well. It's been a beautiful day today. I hope you've been able to get out and you haven't been stuck inside formulating diets or whatever you might be doing. <laughs> I hope you've been having a good day. Um, I'm really excited. Uh, I, I met Billy Herkman. Up, uh, I'm hoping pr I'm pronouncing that correctly, Billy. Please correct me if I'm not. Billy Herkman. I think it's it's Dutch, but that's maybe the first You're time. You're correct, yes. yes. Yeah. yeah, okay, there yeah. he is. Okay, Her Billy Herkman. And um, I was charmed from, from the first, a very unpretentious and very knowledgeable man who is a leading light in, in the US nutrition world. He's a great advocate for raw and, and all aspects of uh, progressive raw thinking. So I'm really, really happy to, uh, if I can work the technology, say hi, Billy. Uh, good evening to, to from us and good afternoon to you. Yes, exactly right. It's only three here, so we're we're doing well. Okay, fantastic. It's great to see you. Are you well? Have you had a good day so far? Yeah, absolutely. Can't complain. Uh, I live here in uh, Philadelphia, and it's you know starting to be uh, sunny and beautiful every day. So can't okay. complain about that. Okay, this is great. Okay, so listen, people are jumping on really, really uh, uh, well here. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Gail and Zoe and Libby. Uh, Libby Halpin says, yes. Here, I can show you. Um, Billy, oh, have I, a look. Yeah, have a look, have a look. Yes. There you go. Have a look. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> I'll take L it. Libby, yeah, for sure. Yeah, life is short. Uh, okay. Uh, Eileen is saying good, uh, a, a good um, best wishes to you. Fantastic. This is good. Uh, and Emma is in the house. She's saying, um, <laughs> greetings to the Kombucha King. Fabulous. Good call, Emma. Great call. Great call. Okay, wonderful. Well, we're all gathering. So, um, so Billy, um, thank you for being with us. Thank you for giving us your time. We really, really appreciate it, this side of the pond. But it's not only, uh, only the Brits. We've got Europeans. We've got the Dutch. We've got um we've got aussies uh, many many different uh, countries are, are, are represented so it's it's great to have you here thank you very very much so tell us about your first experiences with raw what what got you into it in the first place what went, what what got you from being a kibbler fan as we all are because that's the way we're raised unfortunately to being raw interested well in i don't you know, it's interesting because I never had any sort of experience with dogs or cats growing up. I never had a pet. My okay. dog, my current dog is my first dog ever. Okay. Um, and so I was learning it all from the beginning. Um, the, the, the only thing when I got my dog was I asked my mom, you know, beforehand, how much does it cost to buy dog food? And she said, you know, well, I buy the, the, the fancy, more expensive stuff at, at Walmart. So mm -hmm. that was the, um, that was my first intro. Okay. And for whatever reason, I don't know, you know, my wife would tell you, I talk about like four different subjects and that's pretty much it for me. Um, and it probably becomes pretty annoying to her. Well, that's but pretty good. I talk, I talk <laughs> one subject, <laughs> nutrition. That's it. I'm, I am, a, I am a dinner party bore. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's like, um, but nutrition was one of those things. And for some reason, when I got Lua, my dog, who will actually be, um, 15 in August. So she's got a birthday coming up. You know, I said, what do I feed this dog? And for some reason that never became uninteresting to me. I always wanted to push it. I always wanted to figure out what can I do? What can I do? How can I make this better? Um, and that's what really, you know, continues to drive me today. I'm trying to think when my actual first, you know, cause I remember going through the steps that most people go through, which is like, Oh, I'll do this better kibble and I'll put in some canned and I'll do, you know, X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, and I remember home cooking a diet and then I remember switching to raw. Um, and obviously, you know, since then it's been, you know, a whole different story for me, but yeah, it's really shaped, you know, she Lua and, and this pursuit has really shaped my life. And I really just, um, 
you know, we'll never stop appreciating that. That's why I always give her the shout outs on all of the yeah, videos. We, and the... we see. How old is she now? How old is she? So she'll be 15 in August and Whoa. she's, she's, she's doing very, very well. Um, and we, we actually, this spring went for like a baby moon before we had uh, my daughter in May and she went, she's a pug and she went on a five mile hike with us and, and did the whole thing. So she's still, um, she was kind of falling asleep at the end while walking, but um, you know, I take a lot of pride in that. And one of the things that I really love sort of, want to bring to just the industry in general is the ability to try to pr push things further. So I think that, you know, oftentimes we look at, um, and this is kind of a non sequitur, but you know, just something that I think that, you know, Lou has always sort of instilled in me is to say, yes, we know what, you know, the ancestral diet of a, you know, of a dog should be. And we know these factors, but how do we make it better? And how do, how do we continually push that to make it, you know, I think oftentimes we look at diets of animals and say, what is the diet of, you know, a wild dog or a wolf and say, okay, well, that's optimal. Well, maybe not though. Let's make it much better than that. And one of the things that I, um, you know, just an example of that would be, you know, all around the internet, there's this study now with uh, spirulina and, you know, its effects on rabies and it's it also, you know, its effect on allergies. Reduced and, allergies, yeah. And I would posit to you what wolf or wild dog would be eating spirulina. Uh, none of them, mm -hmm. um, but we know it has an, an incredibly positive effect on their physiology for yeah. these foods. Yeah. So, you know, that's what, you know, in the raw segment, that's kind of what I try to bring to the table is how do we push this further? You know, how do we, um, you know, I would say right now, my, you know, the, the bulk of my dog's diet is eggs and raw colostrum. What dog has, what dog has ever lived on uh, fermented raw colostrum? So what dog has ever lived on that Wow. in the history of dogs? Probably none. So she's a, a Guinea pig uh, apparently, but you know, it's kind of like one of those things where, you know, I think that's what, I'm just thankful that, you know, having Lua in my life has inspired that, you know, passion for wanting to do that. So that's amazing. How are her poos on a uh, very, fairly fiber free diet? Well, no, there is, you know, I work for Green Juju and okay. we are a plant based company for the most part. So there is definitely, definitely, I do have experience with animals on the, um, on the, uh, you know, just milk diet side, but um, there is plenty of fiber and plenty of those awesome phytonutrients okay. in the diet. Okay. Um, but I will say this, they are, you know, when I do add the extra protein, it's normally like cod or, or fish based. Okay. And so they are, they are primarily yellow, um, uh -huh. but that's not a problem for me. So, okay. but they're good. Uh, they're good. And she's comfortable and she's good in good. Absolutely. Good shape, obviously. 100%. Amazing. Okay. So I was going to say, what lessons have you learned? But basically, um, uh, Lewis, your teacher and you're, you're learning every day and you're, you're continuing to learn. So you mentioned that, that, uh, you're working now with green juju. Mm -hmm. Tell tell us all about that because it's, it's a new venture and, 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 uh, I think many people won't be familiar with the company. Give us a little bit of background and where you fit in and, and what, what, what they do. Yeah, so we are not a, we don't have a, a complete and balanced food, but what we, so we're in the business of how do we make diets better just generally. So one of the reasons I chose, um, there's a few reasons I kind of chose to work with Green Juju. Um, number one, the founder, um, Kelly, is really great. I've known her for about 10 years. Um, number two, I'm, I'm at a stage in my career where I'm looking to affect as many diets as possible. So, yeah. you know, I love the nutrition nerds out there, you know, all the people watching this that want to do that. But I also have a big spot in my heart for those that don't care about nutrition, that they're going to feed kibble no matter what. And, and how can we impact that diet? How can we make that diet better? Yeah. Um, you know, even if it's, you know, 10% of the diet or a little thing here, a little thing there. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of the space that we're kind of fitting in. And the other reason too was, you know, going back to the innovation thing and kind of pushing those boundaries, you know, we know that plants, you know, being a sort of, you know, mostly plant-based company, we know that plants have a very positive effect. We can look at studies in dogs diets. And I want to, I want to look into that and say, how do we maximize the nutrient content of these things? If you're talking about, 
you know, uh, vegetables, things like that. So basically we have two kind of flagship whole food, uh, supplements. Um, Mm -hmm. so it's basically, um, basically Kelly brought something very innovative to the space of someone might supplement their dog or their dog's diet with, uh, vegetation and they might grind them up or steam them. But what we actually do is juice them and then add the pulp back to break, to break down the cell walls further than that and to sort of pre-digest it. And then we're also adding uh, coconut oil and bone broth to that mix, okay. um, obviously for those benefits. And then also, um, you know, for the fats and even the fat in, in helping to control that blood sugar, you know, in terms of uh, when they're consuming it. We also have a bone broth and then we have, uh, we just released some freeze dried treats as well. Okay. Um, so it's a, it's a small company and a very innovative company. And we are just very excited in the next you know, year or so to come out with a new products. And I think obviously most people are expecting some of those things to be fermented and they would be right, you know, <laughs> down the line here. Inevitably, yeah. yeah, for sure. Great, 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 mm-hmm. great. This is amazing. And uh, how, much, how much nutrient loss? Because obviously as soon as you start chopping up a cabbage, uh, 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 cavalonero, whatever it might be, you will be there will be some oxidation happening there how do you get around that and have you done any testing between the you know fresh 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 and maybe something that's been in your freezer for a month or so i mean are those any studies that you've done um not that i'm familiar with but Mm -hmm. you know when it comes to you know you're going to get oxidation you know in any process um another a good example that would be Um, you know, when I am supplementing, you know, or when I'm formulating my own dog's diet and I mentioned putting fish there, right. I will actually take that cod, uh, the filet and actually put it in like a food processor Mm -hmm. and just pre cut it up and have it in the fridge for, you know, three days or so. I know that there's some breaking down there. There's some slight oxidation, Mm -hmm. but I think that generally when you look at the numbers, especially coming from like the frozen food industry, which is, you know, one of my, uh, mentors, uh, came from, I think that's a slightly overblown in terms of the nutrient loss. You know, okay. you still, if you're looking at, you know, six months shelf life in the freezer, you know, you're, you're not depending on the actual vitamin. So like vitamin E will deplete more than, you know, other vitamins, for example. But, uh, I think, uh, that can be, uh, you know, slightly overstated. So, um, I think, you know, being a small company, we speak more to results, Okay. um you know in that case so gotcha gotcha mm-hmm. okay so but you know what even if you've got five percent oxidation five percent loss of nutrients you're still 95 percent ahead of the hills the royal cannons and the eucanubis of this world so because you, you, you you're putting in real phytonutrients so you know i th- like you say i think it's an academic i was just kind of interested just to see whether has anybody done those kind of studies as to, you know, how much vitamin C degrades over time with freezing? Definitely with, with, with freezing, but probably not with like, you know, the difference between if you have like a full carrot and then chop it up and then look uh-huh. at the, and then look at the nutrients there. But the other thing too, that I think people need to uh, maybe just realize just generally is that, food nutrient testing is not exactly what it's chalked up to be. So if you, you know, a good example of that would be vitamin D it's the test for vitamin D is kind of ridiculous. Like there's no, I mean, you could test the same, you could take, you could send the same food to a lab, you know, 10 times and you'd get different readings for vitamin D. So then you could say, well, we know it's there, but we don't know the exact amount. And so for me, a lot of times I go back to, you know, whole foods, I go back to how do we, you know, build a diet or how do we contribute to a diet? Mm, And mm. it really just goes back to that because, you know, um, a good example of that for me personally, you know, in my own diet, I take fermented cod liver oil Okay. and and on the packaging, they just say contains varying amounts of A and D because there is no way to actually predict exactly how much andy is going to be in every single batch is that being honest about what they put in or is that being realistic about different levels of fermentation because of different points in the vat or whatever it might be 
they just realize that there's 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 too much variety to be able to just nail it down to one figure i think both okay. um okay. yeah tell um, us about the vitamin d thing why is testing vitamin d such a uh, a, a, a a variable feast well i think that the, the sensitivity of the test is not very low so basically it, from what i've seen in terms of vitamin d testing you know and working with like full diets and things like that you or even just products generally you, you you send the test out and you get it back and it'll basically be like it's too low for this test to discover but that too low amount is actually a good amount okay is actually a pretty good amount <laughs> yeah for yeah sure, for sure oh, and for and sure. i would say that's true you know with most fat soluble vitamins vitamin a vitamin k2 um but especially vitamin k2 i mean there's not really good testing for that in general yeah, opinion, yeah, so. yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's, yeah. People get very excited about that with pregnancy. Yeah, so you've probably, you've probably been down that line. You know, do you want a shot for of, of vitamin K, uh, or are you going to manufacture it yourself, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera, mm -hmm. You know, because you are a uh, a new dad. So congratulations. Yes. Well, thank you. Yeah, oh, it's. Cool. Um, yeah. I, I'm doing this um, uh, interview somewhere else for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> I live in a very, I live in an apartment and, uh, no, but she's the best. She's the best. Uh, her name is Maple and she Maple, is just right. the cutest thing in the world. So that's amazing. 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 Okay. So let's, let me just ask you about, there's a big, uh, a, a big division within the raw food world. Those who feed vegetable material of some sort and those who are dead, dead, dead against it. And they just feed animal derived material whether that's mm -hmm. fruit, you know whether they're feeding skin or whether they're feeding horn whether they're feeding good uh, range of, of of organs and um uh, glandular tissue i don't know mm -hmm. but where are you on that i presume you, you're a pro veg guy uh, if you are why are you what's your what's your logic what get what brings you to that place well, you know, I've always been, you know, a pro vet. I'm, I think I've known, you know, previously mostly for animal products, but I've also, you know, been a huge, I've always been a pro veg person in for dog, I mean, for dogs. Um, so even just looking back on the last, you know, 11 years of my career and working with dogs and formulation and those sorts of things, mm -hmm. I've always, you know, this is going to be the anecdotal bit for me. Uh -huh. um, I've always noticed animals having better digestion when they include, if it's just an all meat diet, because I've worked with those sort of products versus an all vegetable diet. I've just noticed that they've always had better digestion. Not only have I noticed in my own dog, but in the, you know, uh, you know, ten, thousands of dogs I've worked with, you know, across, across the country. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I mean, you can just, I think that that the study um, with kibble and green leafy vegetables and kibble and um, uh, orange and yellow vegetables done in 2005. Oh, the Purdue study. Yeah, I think yeah. that, that that closes the book on that we know, that we know, obviously this was done with kibble. So from a science perspective, you can say, yes, all we know is that it's positive for animals with kibble. But I think you can kind of extrapolate that out and say, okay, it would be positive for other animals as well. Yeah. So we know that they are, you know, when you're talking about reducing cancer rates by, you know, 90 and 70 percent, you're talking about those uh, dogs actually, you know, ingesting these plants and getting those phytochemicals and getting those antioxidants. Now the problem runs into when people try to use plants for things that they're not good at, like protein and um, fat and those types of things that I would not be in favor of. So when I, when I talk about things like green juju and adding, you know, the, the blends, they are there for phytochemicals. They're there for antioxidants. They're there for those vitamin precursors like, you know, beta carotene that are, aren't going to turn into vitamin A, but are going to be useful, you know, in an antioxidant capacity or something like that. Yeah. And also, even when you look at ancestral diets, wolves eat plant material when they can. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there are certain, um, uh, there are wolves in certain areas that eat a, a large percentage of their diet as blueberries during certain types of, yeah. during certain times of year. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, other wild, you know, so I think you can kind of look at all of those different things and say, 
um, you know, to exclude something based on a, a philosophy, because I think most of those are philosophical arguments rather than nutrition arguments, because mm -hmm. we know that they have a positive effect. Yeah. So to, to exclude something just because you, you know, want to get back to a certain, you know, idea. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and, and also no dog or cat in the world right now, um, this it may be, you know, that's owned by a person eats what a wolf eats or eats what a, you know, because they don't eat chicken from a grocery store or they don't, you know, we all make concessions along the way. Yeah. And when we do that, I think, you know, the other thing too is I, you know, for dogs living in the city, I think they try to find their greens yeah. by eating grass and right. by doing these things. And obviously we know the chemical load that is coming into a lot of these animals. And so mm. for me, I'm thinking to myself, there's no good reason not to, I've never present been presented with, good evidence or good argument um, to not feed vegetation. I'm with you all the way there. And, and when I speak to people, I say, okay, dogs given half a chance will pick blackberries in the autumn from a, from the bush. Yeah. Without any, you know, my little uh, whippet cross Italian greyhound she, at six months old. Yeah. Fresh out of the womb, her first autumn, she was just, she was picking them, you know, straight off the bush without mm -hmm. any provocation so that says to me that's ancient wisdom also uh cats don't eat v uh, herbivore poo and dogs do you know given half a chance they will they may go for mm -hmm. their own but they will almost inevitably go for rabbit and sheep and horse and and, and what have you so that's it and also even, and i don't know how you can not go with those arguments but they will also eat, if they're eating the carcass, now there's some argument that says, okay, the wolf won't eat the contents of a rumen, of, uh, of an a, a antelope or a sheep or goat or what have you. But you can be absolutely sure they will eat the intestine. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's a lot of good nutrition to be had with the, with the small intestine and the large intestine. And the contamination of those with food material, partially fermented, partially digested, fully chewed uh green grassy material that is that's a slam dunk for me uh that exactly that right. they, they, well, they, they've, they've they've been exposed to this stuff and therefore it's likely that they've developed some kind of necessity to it maybe that's where the spirulina comes in is the the gut contents is so rich and so full of nutrients that maybe spirulina is kind of the closest we can get without feeding gut contents from sure. from 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 sheep and and, and grass-fed cattle now that would be a dream of mine actually would be to get uh, gut contents but small intestine contents from cattle and sheep and put it in a pot and sell it to the public that, that, that is a tr that is a true nutrition nerd talking right there um <laughs> you know i'll tell you something that's very interesting it has nothing it, it sort of has to do with what you're talking about but i just thought this was super fascinating i was doing an event um in chicago recently and yeah. this guy this um guy who had been to a few of the events came up and and was chatting with me and he was actually he's a he's a hunter and he goes down to wyoming to 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 do some hunting stuff there. Yeah. And he was talking about the wolf population in that area and the wolf population is protected. And so they, they basically have like a smorgasbord of whatever they want, right? They have a ton of food, be it game or, you know, sometimes they're actually, you know, eating people's cows, that kind of thing. But here's, I, this just blew my mind. He said that there's so much food there that some of these uh, wolves will actually take down an animal and just eat their placenta and leave the rest. Oh, isn't that the craziest thing? I so mean, it makes sense because it's it's a high value organ. Rich. Yeah, but it just it blew my mind that 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 would be happening. So wow, that's like going to McDonald's and picking out the gherkin and leaving the rest <laughs> behind. <laughs> yeah, it's a very. Um, I'm going to pretend like I know what gherkin means. <laughs> <laughs> um just, just to throw that out there but oh okay well no that's, that would be a fermented um like a dill pickle ah got it okay yeah, oh yeah okay okay yes that makes sense sorry like there, was the a, there was a there was a culture barrier there 
<laughs> I apologise. I thought gherkin was worldwide. Yeah. We used to call them gherkins in New Zealand when I was there. So uh, I apologise. There you go. You learn something every day. That's good. <laughs> We've learned something, Billy. Amazing. Okay, fantastic. Um, great. Good thoughts. Some good thoughts there. And um, uh, Casey from San Francisco Raw has put up some references there, which is very interesting about books on some of these questions of, of how to best preserve uh, vegetables. So it's interesting. It'll be on the uh, on on the comments if you want to have a look afterwards. Um, uh, Casey, we, I spoke to her about a couple of months ago. She's a fascinating woman and an absolute powerhouse. Have you spoken to her at all? San Francisco I, Raw? Yeah, yeah, I did. And um, if it's the person I'm thinking of at a uh, conference in Chicago a few years ago. Okay, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Really impressed. We had a great chat and so friendly and so open with all her knowledge. Fantastic. So um, uh, when we spoke yesterday in preparation, just make sure everything was going to work for today, you said I, you, you, you've seen I, either one of something that I've done or something that the Raw Pet Medics have done. The Raw Pet Medics, by the way, for anybody who hasn't seen it, we're on Tuesdays now at seven o'clock uh, uh, UK time. So please join us. Brendan Clark and Connor Brady and I talk geeky nutrition stuff and have a laugh and take the mick out of each other. And um, it's, a, it's a good nutrition 45 minutes. You're very welcome to come along. But um, Billy, you, you say you saw us, you saw me or us talking about mm -hmm. fat. Yeah, I was there last week for at okay, least, for uh, at least some of it. Yes, I'm a a fan of fat. So it was one of those situations where I was thinking to myself, like, oh, I wish I could chime in on this. But then I was like, oh, I'll actually be with you next week. So maybe I can chime in on it because fat, fat's one of my favorite uh, subjects. And I thought that uh, Connor said something that was just um, exactly, you know, what I've been thinking about for the past, you know, year, year or two. And mm -hmm. I just thought it was so um, right. You know, when we were talking about, you know, omega three to six ratios and talking about, you know, and, and the thing he kind of left it on was, you know, um, one of the things in his book he, he talks about is, you know, it being a five to one ratio mm -hmm. um, from omega three to six, you know, in the average, you know, wild canine diet or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, and that people can become, you know, sort of obsessed with how do we reduce that down to three to one, two to one, one to one, you know, and they're supplementing with all these fish oils to get to that level. Uh -huh. And, um, I just, you know, he said, maybe that's not the right approach. Maybe the right approach is to feed these foods, you know, and then let that ratio go where it, it comes. And I just thought that's exactly sort of what we need to, you know, be thinking about. So when I, you know, formulate my own dog's diet, wow. I just look at the ratio of each ingredient. Uh -huh. And then I say to myself, um, you know, where would the, where, where's the overall ratio going to be? That's just kind of an interesting thing I look at, yeah. but you can, you know, if you're making a diet at home, you can make a diet without doing any supplementation that fits within that healthy range, even two to one or one to one, because, um, and the other thing too on that is, um, and just, just to get people thinking about this, um, because this is kind of the melding of both human nutrition and, and, um, you know, dog nutrition is, the main source of, of omega-3 fatty acids in the diet for most people is fish, right? Because you're looking for EPA and DHA. But something to think about that's very interesting is in mammals, fish are mostly made of EPA, right? We know yeah. that. Yeah. And there's yeah. some DHA there. But mammals are not. And mammal cells actually work better, much, much better with DHA. So the interesting thing to think there is that EPA is useful, but you're going to get more of that, you know, supplementing with mostly fish. Um, and DHA is just a much better source of, of, you know, for the brain and how that works and how the body functions. So one of my favorite places, you know, and you can actually look at the research for this. And I think that this is somewhat lacking as well, because most of the diet formulation systems and most of the info that people are looking at is based on USDA data, right? Mm -hmm. And so we know that that's not going to be relevant to grass-fed beef. We know that's not going to be relevant to pasture-raised eggs. Yeah. Um, the number one thing I use to actually, you know, supplement my dog's diet um, in my formulation is egg yolks. Okay. And the reason why is because if you look at um, – 
if you look at a pasture raised egg, and I think this research comes out of the University of Minnesota, mm -hmm. you can look at the averages in terms of the fat there. Mm -hmm. But the average one chicken egg yolk is going to have 205 milligrams of omega-3 fatty acids, which okay. is a significant con contribution, mm -hmm. wherein 180 of that is DHA. Ah, right. Okay. So you're getting the much, much higher DHA level. So, you know, that can be an overall contributor, but I just think that's kind of interesting that, that, you know, I, I just thought that was very smart of him to say, like, maybe it's better just to feed food and source it correctly. Yeah. I mean, those an analyses where they get five to one, I wonder whether they were carcasses and, and how much, um, organ meat was in there and whether that was a gutted carcass or whether that was n ungutted because the way i look at it is that that you you get omega-3 from leafy greens you get omega-6 from seeds mm -hmm. and so if you've got a a dog eating a rabbit wild fed rabbit who's chomping away on herbs and leafy greens and grass there's going to be a fairly high level of omega-3 in the gut, which is which is kind of transient. And so mm -hmm. I'd be interested to see how what 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 and what analysis, whether they put an entire rabbit into a mincer and and measured omega-3, or whether there was some kind of dressing involved in those carcasses in order to get that five to one ratio. Because it seems strange that that that, that dogs may require five to one and yet humans you know the hunter gatherers they the people everyone i've read says it's kind of about one to one i think it depends i've, I've seen research mm. you know in humans that's anywhere from one to one to nine to one in in being in that scale okay. so I, I i think it would too would depend on the on the person but mm. um yeah you know it's hard to tell but i you know for me personally you know in terms of formulating those diets, I am able to formulate a diet that I'm, I would say is probably if I had to just estimate, cause I don't have it in front of me, but yeah. like, I would say it's probably two to one. Yeah. Um, and I haven't supplemented with anything. Um, yeah, 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 doing yeah. That. I'm just using food and I'm also not, you know, um, and so I just, you know, I, I think it's a very interesting and, you know, you guys also plugging the book, um, uh, deep nutrition was pretty oh. awesome too. Shanahan, um, I love her. Yes, I love her. She's fantastic. So everyone, everyone should. I'm sorry, after you. Everyone should read that book. If you want to, if you want to get get to know, there's two books on on well that just for general nutrition, but also um, Know Your Fats by Mary Inig. That's the other one that everyone should read if you want to know the biochemistry of how fats work. Yeah, I just looked that up. Yep, uh, <laughs> literally. <for> <laughs> an hour ago because you mentioned it yesterday so that's mm -hmm. fantastic that's a good recommendation i always like book recommendations because this is you can really broaden the argument and i you know what if and i don't want to bore everybody about omega omega threes but if omega threes do come from grass and 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 kind of kind of leafy green vegetables uh if you're not anywhere near the sea then it's going to be seasonal, isn't it? It's going to be highest in spring and summer, and it's going to wane in autumn and winter. So one one hundred percent. So those short chain, those, yeah. So uh, a good example of that would be, you know, I live in Pennsylvania here, and mm. we are we are lucky enough to be able mm. to buy raw butter, and. Oh just directly, you know, from the farm, I actually go to a farm and it's an honor system store. So there's just a, a container with money. You take whatever you want, make your own change and the farmer's not even there. But if you notice the butter is going to be totally different nutritional properties during the spring and summer, we try to, you know, it's frozen. So we try to buy as much as we can during the spring and summer because right. you can physically see the difference and you can, and, the same thing with egg production as well. If you live in a winter climate, you're buying local eggs, mm. you'll see the yolk color change. And, you know, you'll see, you know, they can measure the amount of omega threes in something that's, you know, filled or that's, that's eaten grains. Cause you know, you were astute to point out that grains are omega sixes for the most part. And that's why, you know, they're terrible for our diets as well. Yeah. Um, versus, you know, the animals that are, you know, out on pasture. And so, 
if, if, you know, a, a native wolf population or wild dog population was in a climate that changed drastically, yeah, their diet, they might be getting, you know, differing amounts of those, um, you know, those fatty acids throughout the year. Yeah. Um, and even now, I mean, how do you even predict, you know, a wolf's diet in a modern situation? Uh, because the thing that the wolf might be eating, you know, if it's like a deer or something, they might be eating like GMO corn out of a field. So if they're, you know, if they're doing that or, or whatever they're eating, you know, then, um, you know, their diet might be changing as well. But, um, I think, you know, the body is good at adapting at those things. It's good that there's variance there, you know, there's variety yeah. and that we can kind of, you know, go with the flow with that. Um, you know, I would just recommend to people the number one thing, even for me, because I know when I had, you know, when we had maple, um, I love feeding my dog. It's like my favorite thing, putting it all together, doing all that. But, um, I was like, Oh my God, I'm so busy. I can't even, <laughs> you know, at the beginning there, I was like, I have to throw this stuff together and be able to do that. And so, you know, whatever formulation people, um, end up on, do what is available to you and what works and is easy. You know, it's because if it's hard to do that and it's hard to source a particular way, you're not going to do it. And so, you know, that's what I would say to people is do the best you can and, and don't worry too much about, you know, is it a four to one? Is it a three to one? Yeah. If you're, if you're feeding actual food, you're doing, you're doing awesome. So, yeah. Yeah. And the seasons will take care of um, variation, you know, because if you if you if you're shopping locally which i think is a great idea as much as possible and you're using grass fed as much as possible even if you just feed beef and local greens there will be a cyclicity with within the meat that you give i don't think that's a good idea but if you were pushed then nature would provide variation just from a just a season by season basis so that's kind of reassuring there are no straight yeah. lines in nature. A lot of circles, no straight lines. Well, and one side note on that, which I just think is interesting as well. Mm. Um, if you look at the research with grass-fed beef, you know, I've seen basically anywhere from a two to one to one to one omega three to six ratio in grass-fed beef. But here's the really interesting thing. Uh, the overall fat content of beef, there's not that many omega threes in it. So I believe uh, don't quote me on this because again, I'm not looking at my spreadsheet, but I believe it's like 15 milligrams per ounce of omega-3 fatty acids, but okay. you still have that, um, ratio one to one or two to one. You're just not getting a lot of omega sixes. So you're looking at other types of fats as well. And yeah, but if you're not putting a lot of omega six in, you don't need as much omega three to counteract the pro-inflammatory effects. That's maybe, true. you know, you, maybe that. You can look at the base level of what they need to function. That's kind of where I was at. And I, I basically with my own dog's diet, I said, what's the base level of function? I'm going to double that. And then that's what I'm going to shoot for. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that um, because, you know, one of my favorite things is raw milk and uh, fermented raw milk. Uh, you know, been, been doing a lot of that at home. Uh, just from a fatty perspective, because this is just interesting to me. Uh, raw milk has over 400 types of fats in it, and it is the most fat diverse food on the planet. Fermented raw cows, grass fed cows milk. Mm -hmm. Or just raw milk generally okay. has over, has, and that's just what we know. Like they discover new things about it all the time, but mm -hmm. over 400 dif different types of fats, which makes sense because be it, you know, anything, breast milk, goat milk, cow milk, it's all made, you know, it's, it's, it's all made to sustain something completely. And so, um, that's like, you know, a can of worm, can of worms in and of itself. Cause we can, you know, identify and say, look, we have identified omega threes to be healthy. We've identified omega sixes to be healthy and unhealthy, depending on the ratio and how they work. Mm -hmm. But then you kind of open up, you know, you know, the can of worms and say, well, this food has 400 different fatty acids and we know they all have a different metabolic function. So good luck figuring that one out. Yeah. Right? Just sh shows you how little we know. <laughs> Start your PhD now and then <laughs> and then line up for another five after that and you might just scrape the barrel. Exactly. That's amazing. Billy, just 
yeah, we could go on forever. This is a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Is there any any closing thoughts or any events that you want to, or, or or references, um, things that, that 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 stand out that you want to share to point people towards? Um, well, I will tell you this. Um, you know, it is nice to be you know getting back out there and doing some events now, and being able to see people, and so. Um, you know, with Green Juju, we're going to be doing some some events. We're going to be doing some more, um, you know, Facebook lives and things like that. And just for me personally, this year, I'm, I am excited to see people again, actually, and you know, be able to um, go down that road. But you know, professionally, um, check us out at GreenJuju.com. Um, and also, you know, we're not available uh, in the UK yet or anything like that, unfortunately. But okay. If you're in the States or, or um, Western Canada at this point, and we are, I'm just looking forward to being able to, you know, come up with some new cool stuff with Kelly, the founder, and, and be able to help as many dogs and cats as we can. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, Billy, we love your style. We love your knowledge. We love what you're doing. And uh, passing on our very, very best wishes to Kelly and the gang there. You're doing Great work, thank you, and um, thank you so much for sharing your your um, excellent knowledge. We really, really appreciate it. Um, thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, uh, anytime. It's great, fantastic. It's so great to see you. Thank you, Billy. Um, guys, that's us for now. Uh, if I was really organised, I'd tell you when the next one was, but I'm not. So keep your eyes on Instagram and Facebook. And we're going to have a George Orwell fairly soon. Um, but there you go. Uh, it's the brave new world of the post-COVID. And summer is coming. So I'm going to be going on holiday and doing all sorts of things like that and reading lots of raw and nutrition books to tell you about. Guys, thank you so much. Uh, be well, feed well, and speak to you soon. Thank you so much have for joining us this evening. Thank you.